the uh, first of our department research seminar series this year. And uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, Professor Coretta Phillips will be giving uh, the first seminar. Um, of course, most of us know Coretta very well, so I don't need to introduce her. But um, just to say uh, a few words, Coretta is Professor of Criminology and so Social Policy in the Department. Her research has made a major contribution to the fields of race, ethnicity, crime, uh, criminal justice, and social policy. And indeed, um, that contribution is very much reflected in what she'll be talking about today. So uh, Coretta's talk will be uh, looking at sleeping into the post-racial race and social policy, which draws on a paper that she co-authored with uh, Fiona Williams. Uh, she is currently working on an ESRC funded uh, research project that's uh, looking at the uh, crime and criminal justice experiences of gypsies and travellers in uh, England, picking up on uh, what we mentioned last week. Uh, she's drawing, she's uh, doing historical as well as um, current qualitative and quantitative uh, research uh, through that project. Um, so we look forward uh, to hearing some of the preliminary findings, perhaps in another seminar presentation uh, going forward. So uh, in our slightly bizarre hybrid world, I will now hand over to Coretta, who will be presenting uh, virtually from next door, but she will be joining us in the room for questions afterwards. Coretta, thank you. Thanks, Isabel. Um, I'm really not sure what you can see. Um, so I'm hoping I'm hoping you can see my PowerPoint slides. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thanks to Timo and Lucinda for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about some of these ideas. And as um, Isabel said, um, some, at least some of what I'm going to be talking about today is based on a paper that I co-authored with Fiona Williams. And so I'm hoping this will nicely set up the context for her book launch, which is in a couple of weeks time, um, where she's got, a, you know, a much more expansive intellectual agenda, I think. But what I wanted to do in this talk was to um, begin with some of the kind of reflections fairly briefly on the decolonizing debates. And this is obviously very topical at the moment, but it's also relevant because I think that Hakan and a team of researchers will be talking about what decolonizing our reading lists might look like um, very soon. So what I'm going to do in the presentation is just um, set out some of those. I don't know if, what you can see at the moment. Can you see the second slide? Yeah, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to um, talk about some of these debates fairly briefly and look at the way in which some scholars have attempted to try and look at this empirically um, in a systematic but very limited way. And then I'm going to introduce Emma Baron Desmond's uh, disciplinary reflexivity framework, part of which I think really I found very useful to think about um, how we look at the representation and conduct of of how disciplines operate and how knowledge is produced. Um, and then I'll give some examples of the application um, of the framework to the two disciplines that I'm most familiar with, which are really um, criminology and, and to a, a lesser extent social policy. And then I wanted to end with some questions. Um, I know it should be questions and answers. You know, you ask the questions and I give the answers, but actually I've got a series of questions which I'd like to ask of, of my colleagues really to kind of try and open this up a little bit. Okay, so I think we're in this really interesting intellectual and political moment where there's been quite a lot of introspection and soul searching at the centre of disciplines, particularly in thinking about um, the degree to which they have been de-racialized at the core, so at the mainstream of disciplines. And this is obviously, of course, situated most often recently, at least in the decolonizing the curriculum agenda or decolonizing knowledge production. Um, and so many of you here will be familiar with Rob Tell's work, um, which gives, I think, a, a, a valuable um, illustration of this current in which she um, look specifically at the deracialization of development studies. 
And I think this agenda is also interesting and, and well, not just interesting, but significant because it's very much come from pressure from below. Um, so globally, at least, it's come from students in low income and middle income countries, countries of the global south who um, have been concerned about the way in which um, knowledge um, is produced and, you know, who has the authority for their knowledge to be um, acted upon and, you know, what makes it into the canon of disciplines. And I'm sure many will remember this time last year um, as a department, we were um, beginning to think about these issues because we had many of our undergraduate and master's students writing into the department um, concerned about uh, faculty representation, um, what some saw as the kind of narrowness of our curriculum, and more generally the kind of virtual signaling of, of the LSE as, a, as an institution when it comes to race equality. And of course, all of this was in the context of the George Floyd murder. And um, uh, well, that was just one of many, of course, but also um, the Black Lives Matter protests. So in terms of the kind of academic thinking around decolonizing the university, even though there's now increasingly resistance to the kind of decolonizing bandwagon, um, there is at least an attempt to think about how knowledge is, has been produced historically um, in elite institutions like LSE in the Imperial Metropole, um, and how these kinds of knowledges have been um, implicated directly and indirectly in, in reproducing um, racial hierarchies globally. Um, and, uh, and, and many would argue that those patterns are still in place today. Um, and I know some of us here will be familiar with David Pearshow's work, our former colleague, um, who in an edited volume looked at some of the colonial legacies of social policies in, um, in what were um, Britain's former colonial territories. In terms of the disciplines that were kind of centrally um, situated alongside, I think it's probably sociology that's gone the furthest um, in articulating and evidence in these kinds of claims. And so, these claims of deracialization. So we've seen increasingly the foundational ideas of key thinkers like Durkheim, Weber, Marx, Foucault, Bourdieu, um, and Giddens have been critiqued more recently for um, not having paid due attention to um, countries and societies outside of the West um, or where they've homogenized and exoticized or inferiorized, I can never say that word, um, uh, neglecting those societies um, and in particular the role of um, Western states in their kind of imperial con conquests. So not sufficiently focusing on um, empire building, colonization and decolonization, assuming this kind of linear um, narrative towards modernity. We've seen some of these critiques emerge in um, economics and political science, but I think they've had much less traction. Um, and in fact, Emma Baron Desmond, whose framework I use to look at to um, look at our, these these two disciplines reflexively, have, have actually highlighted the failure of these disciplines in some ways to um, engage fully. Um, and although Certainly, it's true that there is a healthy sociology of race and ethnicity. Um, scholars working within that subfield have also been concerned that their ideas, their key ideas and contributions have been somewhat relegated to the periphery of the discipline. And one of the things which I think is interesting and also slightly confusing is the way in which disciplines that we might assume would be centrally focused on questions of race and ethnicity have tended to often obscure and deracialize, at least in the mainstream of those disciplines. Um, and there's a kind of confusion about this absence. Um, and I've included here a quote from Fiona Williams, um, an, an earlier paper that she wrote, 
looking specifically um, at the context of migration, the political and the economic context, and also the kind of cultural and social context of migration, particularly around opposition to migration. Um, and says here, in a sense, if, if migration is about anything, it's about social policy, and yet we don't see it in the mainstream of our discipline. This is in spite of the fact that if contemporary public and political discourse about migration is about anything, it's about welfare provision. And I've certainly thought alongside colleagues in criminology, how is it that penological studies, at least in England and Wales, focus so little on race? There is this kind of default to look at the US context, which is, is always a bit odd because there have certainly been periods in time where the degree of disproportionality and the overrepresentation of minority ethnic groups in the criminal justice system, specifically in the prison system, has actually been higher in England and Wales than it has been in the US. And in our most recent paper that was published um, earlier this year, um, Fiona and I also have added to this list that she presents here is the, um, obviously the hostile environment and securitization social policies, police surveillance and violence, state, um, uh, uh, violence by state agents um, as part of law enforcement and the immigration um, system, and of course the marked vulnerability of minority ethnic groups to COVID. So most of these kinds of critiques have been, uh, of the, the, or the contentions at least, of the deracializing of disciplines has been somewhat abstract. Um, Although there have been at least some attempts, piecemeal, you know, kind of fairly limited attempts to try and document this deracialization. And one approach has been to systematically map um, the content of journals um, or the representation of race at annual conferences. And these typically, there's obviously a variety of methods, and it's it's indicative and perhaps no more than that but they typically look at the very least uh, in the searches of titles and abstracts. And I've just included one here that I conducted with colleagues, um, uh, criminology, uh, other fellow criminologists. Um, and we looked at the um, premier, I think premier, at least in Europe, European uh, Penological Journal, Punishment and Society. And we looked over quite a long time period looking at references to race. And, as you can see from the table, if we look across the different time periods, we do see um, an increase in substantive focus on race, um, which is very much to be welcomed. But actually, when we looked in more detail at the content of those papers, which made some substantive reference to race, um, the vast majority of these were looking at the US. And there were, in fact, over the whole time period of nearly 20 years, only four papers that looked at race in England and Wales, and one of those papers was one that I'd written. A similar approach has been taken in the commissioned research of um, the Social Policy Association recently in their report that you can find on their website. And they looked at BAME, Black and Minority Ethnic, and obviously that should be in inverted commas, and we're all familiar with the um, problematic nature of that kind of catch-all aggregate term, but it's used here to look at representation in what we would see as a premier journal in our discipline, the Journal of Social Policy, and we can see very few focused on questions of race looking in the UK, and a relatively also small number of um, academics or scholars, authors, um, who are represented in the journal. And that same report by Gary Craig, Bancoli, Cole, and Nezreen Ali looked also at um, representation at annual conferences. And they look at the number of papers, as you can see here, over a much shorter time period than we looked, but um, they provide an annual average um, across this time period, 2013 to 2018. Um, and sorry, I can just see a typo there. Um, and of the 183 papers, in the um, annual meeting of the Social Policy Association, 
you can see that there's a really small number focused on race related topics um, or, and or involving um, presenters by of minority ethnic origin. And then on the right hand side of the slide, I've just um, quoted Rob Tell's paper, looking at the white gaze of development um, and suggesting that, uh, you know, she very clearly sets out that she's uh, not providing a genealogy of development studies. And I would make the same claim in relation to social policy and, and criminology. But having said that, she finds very little reference to race, again, in an area that we would think would there would be substantive engagement. So in some ways, the kind of question is about what's going on. Um, and I found it really useful for trying to interrogate this deracialization and to think about questions of decolonization um, by going back to some work that I've done previously, looking at the um, epistemology to look at how knowledge is produced around race in, in disciplines. And um, Emma Baron Desmond's framework, I think, is really helpful for focusing our attention at different levels and what we should be paying attention to and trying to look at this in a systematic way. Having said all of that, and they're, they're drawing on um, Bourdieu's work, looking at reflexivity, um, and the uh, having now used this framework to look at both social policy and criminology, and criminology first, there's certainly some... Um, uh, limitations of this model in terms of um, the clarity and the overlap between some of these practices. And also there's a, a broader question about whether um, what's going on in the production of knowledge about race in these disciplines is really happening at an unconscious or a conscious level. But with those caveats in mind, I'm going to focus in the rest of the presentation on particularly the social unconscious, but more on the disciplinary unconscious. And I'm not going to say very much about the scholastic unconscious, because I don't think this applies particularly well to social policy, if at all. Um, perhaps slightly, it applies slightly, um, it can be um, more meaningfully applied to criminology, I think. But essentially, Emma Barron and Desmond are talking about the ways in which um, the unconscious works in the academy through, um, you know, its ivory tower through ideas that are abstracted from everyday life. Um, and they caution against the risk that sometimes this can lead in one of two directions, one towards eulogizing minority ethnic cultures, so sanctifying every aspect, every aspect of kind of cultural practice of different groups or alternatively um, demonizing them um, and seeing them as entirely inferior. So um, as I say, I don't think this applies particularly well to social policy as a discipline, given our, um, our practice and also our, you know, our focus very much in engaging with policymakers and lots of other interested audiences. The social unconscious is about, and I'll say a bit more about this in a moment, but it's primarily focused on trying to um, illustrate the whiteness of disciplines within the social sciences, particularly um, in relation to questions of race. And so it looks at the biographical positioning of scholars as a way of trying to understand what, you know, where people are located and the degree to which their objective position, but also subjective understandings impact the way in which we see the world and construct knowledge. And the disciplinary unconscious is really looking at the theoretical currents of discipline. So it's looking at the positions that are possible. And, and this actually requires not only a focus on what's going on within the mainstream of a discipline, but also thinking more about where that discipline sits in the social sciences um, as a whole, and perhaps we might come to this in the discussion, it's relevant for, you know, where the Department of Social Policy sits in the London School of Economics and Political Science. So it's about the theoretical currents and also the social relations, the organisational dynamics of disciplines. Um, and there's one other element that they talk in the, about in their longer piece, that there's very little 
discussion of, which is looking more at the kind of psychic effects of how knowledge is produced. And I think probably much of this really fits into the social unconscious. So I'm not going to say anything more about that for now, partly as well in the interest of time. So looking at the um, social unconscious, this is about making visible the whiteness of our disciplines um, in our ideas, our concepts, our theories, our disciplinary tools, our methods and our forms of analysis. And one of the examples that Emma Baron Desmond used is the um, default to using the white majority ethnic group as the reference category in multivariate analysis and against which all um, experience is judged and assessed. And I think that's much less um, a criticism of social policy than it is of criminology. So I think there are multiple examples um, of uh, in criminology where there is an um, where the minority ethnic groups get aggregated together and then their experience is assumed um, or is judged against the majority white um, ethnic group. And I think that's probably, there's a bit more um, larger subsample sizes in social policy, particularly in the, you know, the large household surveys, to at least present, prevent some of that practice. But I think it goes further. It's also about the predominance of positivist approaches um, in the study of racial inequalities, which can risk, I think, assuming that there is um, just uh, in, the, in some ways a kind of simplistic assertion of the presence of racial difference and potentially racism or, or its absence. And yet this doesn't really fit with the way in which sociologists have understood um, race and ethnicity. It's more ambiguous status. Sometimes it's kind of more ephemeral nature in the way it plays out in empirical realities. And so um, I think the kind of certainty that racism only operates in a kind of singular way, it's either present or absent, is, um, is problematic for what we know about race and, and other forms of identity and the relevance of it for um, you know, outcomes in relation to particular um, social policies. It also effectively neutralizes the kind of historical context of what race means. It, you know, it, it divorces um, the, in the operationalization of race and ethnicity, it, it can often operate in ways which are entirely divorced from the historical relevance of race and, uh, race and ethnicity in a way which I think is problematic or can be. In the social unconscious, there's also the argument that we need to recognise that some of our core concepts um, are likely to be ethno-racially and culturally mediated, that they don't operate in a sing again in a singular way, whether we're talking about um, care or concepts of dependency, um, of agency, autonomy, of freedom, of rights, all of these kinds of concepts may um, be uh, quite variable and and in um, in the paper but also this is addressed much more comprehensively in um, Fiona Williams books um, we she talks about the importance of understanding the kind of historical and geopolitical context of care um, and even at, at the beginning Isabel mentioned some research which if we weren't in a COVID environment, I would actually be undertaking, but I'm not at the moment, but looking at gypsies and travellers and what care means for those communities may well be um, really very different as white minority ethnic groups than it is for the white majority or indeed other minority ethnic groups. But in her book, she talks about how care's, um, you know, historically been devalued, of course, is both gendered and racialized but needs to be understood not just in the kind of current context, but in a longer history of racialized servitude, um, deriving from the use of labor by Britain's um, colonial subjects or former colonial subjects. So this idea that we can somehow abstract care from its historical geopolitical context, I think is what Emma Baron Desmond would see as a failing of um, 
the social unconscious. I want to just say something very briefly about biographical positioning because I'm certain that there may be, well, perhaps I shouldn't say I'm certain, but there's certainly the possibility that um, what I'm about to say will just be characterized as subjective or as that anecdotal. And there's a kind of risk in telling these sort of victim tales that it comes across almost as a kind of special pleading um, but I think it's unhelpful to think about these kinds of examples in that way, um, abstracting them again from their broader kind of um, economic, political um, and historical context, despite the fact that, of course, we have a wealth of evidence on the way in which racism um, and discrimination operates in the academy. So, for example, when I attended an overnight academic event, and a white female research officer offered to leave her bedroom door open for me as we both vacated our hotel bedrooms, she saw me first as a hotel cleaner, not as a fellow academic. And it was interesting because today I was teaching in the NAB and I was faffing around at the entrance because I was trying to find the email from the NHS that I could show to get access to the building. And while I was doing that, a minority ethnic student came up to me and he waved his phone in my face because he was running late, as was I, for a nine o'clock start um, and assumed that I was a member of the security staff. Um, and those kinds of moments that um, Elijah Anderson, esteemed black sociologist Elijah Anderson has talked about, suggests that, you know, even in the university, we are racialized beings and um, that can mean that we are perceived as having an inferior intellect, that we're seen as not able to occupy high status positions or even to be criminally involved. And although that may seem extreme, I do actually have an example of that at LSE of somebody being accused of being involved in crime, a black scholar. So it's not that these things are just, um, you know, happening out there in other institutions. They're very much happening at LSE. And I think, you know, it, it, it's useful for us to remember that um, it may not just be intellect alone, which determines who wins and loses on the academic playing field. You know, the fact that we, in our work, recognise um, the... Uh, unmeritocratic un society that we live in, we shouldn't really be very surprised if we also find that um, within our own institution. And so very much today, as this student was waving his phone in my face, I did feel um, like a, um, Puwa talks about um, minority scholars um, in the academy as being space invaders, that we're kind of out of place, even if we manage to master the airs and graces of, of um, what's required in an academic um, environment, we can still really easily be positioned in an um, in inferior way. And that's perhaps why I feel a, a degree of affinity with the um, security and porters at LSE, perhaps just as much as I do with um, uh, faculty and um, other PSS staff. So perhaps uh, uh, what may interest colleagues most is um, the disciplinary unconscious and the application in um, Emma Bauer and Desmond's framework, because here they're looking at the kind of theoretical positions that scholars take with regard to race and ethnicity. They look at the, the and they think about it in terms of the, li the lines behind which um, different camps stand because this is where as you come into a disciplinary field you learn what's possible and also what's likely to make your career successful so in their um, in in the um, in their account of race and reflexivity they um, look at the trajectory of dominant paradigms their emphasis is on sociology and primarily US sociology um, but as I said before, it's also helpful to think about the place of social policy and criminology within um, 
uh, the social sciences more generally, but it it requires us, I think, at least to think about the kinds of coalitions and the groupings that um, scholars are drawn to. And the disciplinary unconscious is also about the organisational dynamics, the social relations of disciplines. Um, and so collectively, I think this quote sums up what, what they're interested in. And keeping in mind, of course, that this their argument is much of this is occurring at an uh, at a potentially at least a kind of unconscious level. So it's about looking at the traditions of a um, of a discipline, its national particularities. Many will have noticed also in the table that I presented earlier of this um, SPA data and conferences that um, social policy has a predominant UK focus. Um, and that was made clear in the papers that were presented. But it's also about looking at its obligatory problematics, its habits of thought, its shared beliefs, its self-evidences, <clears throat> its rituals and consecrations, its constraints as regards the publication of findings, um, its specific forms of censorship, not to mention a whole set of presuppositions inscribed in the collective history of the speciality. So all of this is relevant for understanding, or it, I think it provides a useful um, and a systematic framework for thinking about social policy and criminology, as I say, the disciplines that I'm most um, familiar with. Now, everyone here will be, of course, uh, will know um, the foundation of UK or um, British social policy, the kind of foundational tenets of its um, pragmatic and empirical focus, its interest in the ideas of government, and actually the same, same kind of criticism has been levelled at criminology as well. And social policy for many years was very much invested in the idea of a, a benevolent nation state, um, an assumption that if we gradually reform society through sometimes whole scale interventions, sometimes smaller scale interventions, we would ultimately move in the direction of creating equality and trying to, you know, um, take the edge off of capitalist excess. Um, and this was all underpinned by um, a, a kind of a, an ideological and political investment in um, social democratic ideas. And I think um, William's work talks about the way in which, in which these, um, these elements of these kind of foundational elements have had a significant impact on theoretical discussions within social policy have shaped the ideas of the Webbs um, and Titmus and a number of others. But in particular, um, William's work suggests that we should be paying much more attention to the historical context, that the backdrop to all of this was not just what was going on in Western European countries, but also the way in which Britain and indeed many other um, European nations were you know, deeply implicated in kind of colonial conquest. Um, and there are both implicit and explicit signs of this kind of complicity. And I think all of the same kind of arguments can be made about the foundations of criminology too. In its post-war heyday, social policy very much assumed a homogeneity, a national homogeneity that was um, expressed through citizenship and access to social rights without really engaging with the context of um, the impact on that for um, people from Britain's former colonial territories. So at the center of the discipline, I don't think um, there was very much focus on um, the more kind of coercive elements of social policy. Um, and so even if we look at, um, for example, Ian Goff's work, which I studied as a social policy student, um, well, it's called social administration then, it was so such a long time ago that I did my undergraduate degree. Um, 
and but even in his work that I was really infused by I remember when I first studied it in the 1980s uh, yeah early 1980s late 1980s sorry um it was interesting that he didn't really talk about the racialized division of labor and the political economy of welfare that was very much steeped in its colonial origins and histories and i think that what we've seen more or, or what we began to see in the 1980s was the penetration of ideas of black feminists for example of anti-racist critiques mostly people working to some degree not perhaps less cultural studies and more sociology but some of those ideas were able to penetrate the discipline and to um, be considered um, significant for a while but then um, in, in the paper, we talk about the um, recentering of the discipline to look at welfare regime analysis, where um, you know, this moved into kind of core theoretical um, position, drawing very heavily on comparative analysis, including of the um, Nordic welfare states. And in these ideas, and I think this is true of subsequent theoretical developments as, as well, there's been a tendency to focus on um, axes of strat stratification, which are almost entirely about social class um, and about economic inequalities. And I think this is true in criminology too, um, that class is seen as the primary and sometimes the only vector of experience that gets analysed in social policy research. And of course, it's undeniable its importance, but I think Fiona and I were in, are in agreement that there's much to be learned from um, the sociologists of race and ethnicity, um, particularly looking at the relative autonomy of race um, and class um, that we see in, in Stuart Hall's work and Paul Gilroy and a number of others. And even to some degree, this has been evident in um, the discussion around new social risks and more recent um, foci on left political parties and labour movements in historical institutionalist um, theories. It seems surprising to me that there isn't more that we could draw into these um, perspectives. Um, there's so much available in the ideas of um, people like Gaminda Bambra and Satnam Verdi, which draw on these colonial histories of welfare, um, which look at racial capitalism, look at racial neoliberalism, look at the insularities of labour movements and left, uh, centre left political parties. And have also engaged in a, a I think, a, a more nuanced understanding of, of what constitutes the working class, who, you know, the, the ways in which the um, working class has been explicitly racialized and kind of weaponized effectively in, in current political terms. And it's a surprise to me that more of these ideas don't seem to have made their way into those. Um, mainstream social policy analyses. So in their framework, they then go on to look at the social relations of disciplines and um, of course social policy and as I said before, criminology is being um, criticised for too closely following the agenda of government or, and the priorities of governments. Um, and this obviously would not seem to bode particularly well um, when questions of race are concerned, particularly when we recognize the pretty seismic shift to the right that we've seen um, in political ideologies here and in lots of other countries, um, or at least until there was the George Floyd moment and Black Lives Matter and COVID. It also seems to me to be a, a kind of valid question of um, what's happening to the ideas of early career researchers. Do they feel able to 
given the kind of tenure and promotion systems that we have in operation, um, it, it, does it feel um, safe in a sense and, and sensible to consider questions of race? Or are we, have we kind of moved in the direction of a sort of career instrumentalism in which actually early career academics might think that they need to focus their research interests around professorial colleagues who will make judgments about their um, career development. Does this mean that we move away from the kind of research questions, concepts and theorizing, um, or you know, essentially are those, those agendas um, adopted by early career researchers um, in order to be successful? And we've all kind of moaned about the ref, or, and I've probably moaned more than anyone else, having um, had to work on aspects of it last year and in previous, in, in previous recent years. But um, there's also a concern that the ref itself has made us um, operate in ways which we, um, and I, I, I mean, this is really an empirical question, a possibility rather than a um, a kind of evidence claim, but I think there is a question about whether it's led to more narrow specialization, which might also preclude um, a focus, uh, you know, kind of interdisciplinary focus on race. And then I think obviously we all know just how solitary the academic enterprise can be at times. Um, you know, there are many people that work as lone scholars and and I think it's worth reflecting on what feels like a safe space, a collective space um, for scholars from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. So just to kind of sum up, not quite sum up as such, but lead into perhaps our discussion and, and um, questions, but I wanted to so I think what we're trying to do in the paper in many ways is quite simple. It's about trying to advocate for a historical context for understanding the contemporary contours of race and to move beyond the kind of economic and class-based analysis. And I think, you know, the, the title is obviously kind of deliberately provocative, but I think you know, there's a risk that if social policy doesn't centralise race and doesn't engage with race, then effectively it gets positioned as, um, uh, you know, implicitly endorsing the post-racial um, agenda, you know, the idea, the political discourse that racism, if it occurs at all, only occurs at an individual level and isn't something that's much more institutionalised and part of the um, structural framework of, of how society operates. So, you know, in our social system, our institutions and our culture. And this kind of critical scholarship is really important, uh, you know, perhaps more so than, than ever, given that, you know, I think as a department, we have um, at least some people would see themselves as scholar activists. Um, and the shift that we've seen in, in in actually a relatively shockingly short space of time um, means that many of these questions around race are, are you know, are, are perhaps even more important than they've ever been. So I had some questions that I wanted to, that I hope we might talk about in the discussion. Um, and so one of the questions is, why is it that welfare histories, not, not entirely across the board, but have often neglected race, have neglected colonialism, have neglected empire building? And then a second question, which is around, and this is true both in social policy and criminology, that gender analysis has made, as just had more traction than questions around race. Um, one possibility is that that reflects the interests and the, you know, the, the kind of actual numeric um, representation of women in social policy and criminology compared with um, minority groups. 
And then a third question, which I'd be very interested in Hakan's view on, is the degree to which, in the context of the research that he's done with um, in, in his research team, is whether the decolonizing agenda is useful for bringing race in from the margins or not. And at the same time, and I think this point's really important, I certainly don't want to privilege race um, at the expense of social class. And I think the way Gail Lewis puts it is exactly my thoughts on it, which is that we need to understand the um, very obvious way in which social class um, shapes and mediates experience and access to social policies and you know access to a variety of things that we're interested in in the department but it's not the only social division um, and axis of stratification that's relevant so we need to find some way is it possible to do this in that we um, can hold race and class as relevant rather than sidelining one or the other so uh, we're going to try to take questions from those of us who are in person as well as those of us who are on zoom um, but of course Caressa posed some very interesting questions which maybe uh, we will have reflections on um, so Maria is going to field questions from those uh, joining us by zoom if you want to raise your hand or if you want to contribute to the discussion in terms of uh, Caretta's questions. No? Anybody in the room here? Sunil. Caretta, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, which I think um, provided a lot of uh, food for thought. And in the context of um, the idea of social policy and development, I was wondering to what extent uh, you think um, race itself might be a limiting term, given that there's a lot of work being done with uh, indigenous groups, ethnicity and caste, and in a sense, it leaves out a large part of the global majority. And secondly, is if we pursue that line of thinking, including and beyond race, then we are also thinking of uh, perhaps a different ontology and different epistemology of understanding what social policy and what development means to the different groups that we are working with, in addition to, uh, to gender, to disability, to all other kinds of characteristics. And I just felt that the question of ontology and epistemology is also linked to this idea of the disciplinary unconscious as well as the social unconscious in terms of acceptance of what knowledge production is and can be more important. And also thinking of the work of uh, Will Winter, uh, this was uh, Santos and what the Mignolo and Catherine Walsh around that idea of opening up those spaces. Thank you. Um, I mean, I mean, it's not a question to you, but I think it's a question oh, for us, okay. in a sense. I mean, I, I would respond by saying I think that in some ways that reflects the, it reflects the bias of a particular focus of attention on, on certain regions of the world rather than others. But it's also, um, it's also hard to move away from the concept of race because it has this kind of everyday common sense understanding. And so I'm not sure that it's, um, I'm not sure we're at a kind of political moment where, um, where we cannot talk about race. And in part, that's perhaps because we, we, we need to talk about racism. Sorry, I'm really struggling with this mask. Um, but I think that the kind of subaltern perspectives and the ontologies of um, those groups that are subordinate and marginalised across multiple kind of axes of stratification, all of that's relevant for what we're talking about. But I've kind of stuck with race in part because it feels like this 
um, problematic concept that we just we deconstruct in the, the academy, but that has <laughs> huge relevance and understanding outside. So I'm kind of caught between the rejection of it as a useful analytical category and um, you know, it, it's kind of everyday understanding. So I wouldn't see race, for example, as exclusive of the other identities that you talked about, particularly in relation to class, but many others. Thank you. Uh, Haka. Thanks, Coretta. That was absolutely fantastic. It's just such a good start to the year. Um, I will try to respond to your question to me and, and to Kitty, I guess. And I'll, uh, I mean, Kitty may disagree with me, but I think she will probably um, go along some way with what I will say. Um, I think decolonization is a tool. And as a tool, it can open a space for further discussions of um, race and, and opens a space for uh, these debates to take place. However, on its own, as a tool, without the intentionality of anti-racism and anti-coloniality, it will not achieve much. Because you can decolonize things performatively. I mean, as, as we see all over the place, this bandwagon issue, people are decolonizing. But what matters is why people are trying to decolonize. It's just a tick box exercise, tick box exercise, or really there's a sort of political commitment to anti-racism in this instance and anti-coloniality. I think that's a sort of tool which would take us towards that if we intend to, intend to go there. Otherwise, I mean, I don't think it will do anything. It will actually shut down the discussion. And I don't want to anticipate more what we might say in our report. Kitty, do you, I mean, just if you want to disagree, of course, please. No, no, I don't disagree at all. I mean, we've been having really interesting discussions with the students on the who've been um, working with us on the the decolonization, uh, the kind of mapping we've been doing, um, and talking a lot about the difference between the thing that's easy to focus on, which is diversity, and what we're we're citing on our reading lists, and and actually decolonizing in terms of thinking about epistemologies and 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 I yeah I think there is there's a there's a there's a danger of just I guess there's two ways to see it on one way there's a danger of seeing it kind of seeing diversity as the goal and therefore it's a it's a process of just kind of looking at who you're not citing and who you're what countries you're referencing in your reading list and then it's job done but I hope that that's in, I mean it's difficult to take all, all of this on at once so I'm hoping we see that as a sort of first step and that helps us just to kind of keep thinking and realize that actually that is just a first step. And um, and I think what Hakan's saying about the kind of intentionality is really important that our intentionality, yeah, that, that we have a bigger goal in mind than just making sure that different parts of the world are represented on our reading list and different, different ethnicities of authors and so on. Certainly it's been very educational for me being part of this this working group with the students and with Hakan. No, I think I, I just learned a lot, all of us. I think it was just phenomenal experience. Thanks for participating. Thanks, Hakan. Sonia, you have done. Oh yeah, I, 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 yeah. Uh, thanks, Coretta. I thought that was brilliant. And I, yeah, it's, it's got me thinking very deeply. Mm -hmm. I feel I'm thinking very deeply about our subject. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't answer the questions that you posed, but I actually was going to ask a question as well. So I liked the bit where you, you were talking about kind of why, why are we not doing more sort of um, looking at race and talking about race and, um, and the, what you said about following the money. And I just wondered about, has anybody ever done anything looking at the funding bodies, like where all the money in social policy does come from, like in terms of the research grants? Isn't it just people are not applying for grants that talk about race and talk about race very much or in a tokenistic way? Or is it that they're also not, like when they get peer reviewed, they're not kind of getting through as much either. I mean, so 
Yeah, and I just wonder about research funding. Yeah, uh, where's, where's the kind of obstacles? I don't know. I don't know of any research that's been done um, other than, not research as such, but I remember that there was an intervention on Twitter last summer, I think, from um, a collective of minority academics who were upset about the funding of projects looking at COVID and its impact on minority ethnic groups, which it mostly involved white scholars right. and I think at that point there was some reflection um, by the funding agencies but I don't know if there's been any work that's looked at that in any systematic way I mean yeah. people that I talk to kind of will say anecdotally oh you can't get anything you won't get anything funded if it's on race at yeah. the moment and so I predict obviously after the George Floyd and everything there'll be a period of two or three years when race will be popular and has kind of political currency and it will get funded and then it will disappear yeah. off the political agenda again, I think. But it'd be interesting to see like long term how it's, how the, you know, the number of projects and or I guess it's hard to get access to what information on what was and wasn't funded. And also who's doing the work. So, yeah. you know, if you wanted to look at minority scholars, then they would be more often in... <laughs> you know, the kind of so-called lower league institutions. Yeah. Maybe there's less infrastructure and support yeah. there. Maybe there's less kind of mentoring, I don't know. Yeah. You know, that may all be part of the picture. Yeah. Um, I was kind of curious because a lot of the presentation was about sort of like what lessons uh, social policy can learn from the way like sociology has approached this topic. And as a sociologist, I would say, I'm curious what you think about the, the ways in which they, they can learn from the mistakes of sociology on this topic as well. Um, and, and obviously there's, you know, historically you can, you can, you can point to many, but I'm, I'm curious of like the way you see it being done more contemporarily. And then yeah, I, mean, I definitely have, have thoughts on this myself, but I'm curious what, what you have to say. Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting question. I mean, it, I think that, maybe helpfully or unhelpfully there's a distinction here between the US and probably even British sociology and then European and other sociologies um, but I think here that it's interesting that in the kind of subfield of sociology of race and ethnicity that's seen as really healthy here you know there are there's um all kinds of events, there's sections within the professional association. Um, and it's it's no longer considered as kind of um, not quite marginal, but it's it's very much the focus of attention and people um, there's much more of a research agenda. And I've kind of wondered about what that's about, whether that's you know, kind of pipeline issue that people are attracted more to sociology than social policy, although how can that possibly be? You know, like, I mean, I, I don't know whether it, it reflects the interests of minority students. Um, I think that certainly for me, thinking about this, when I did my degree in, I started in 1987, and I found social policy so exciting. I felt, really felt like it, it spoke to my own kind of biographical history. And I don't know if I'd feel the same way now. I mean, you know, it's a kind of, it's a sort of counterfactual in a way, isn't it? But it felt like a really vibrant time to be talking about issues of race. But then most of that was from sociology. And in, in terms of your question about what that, I mean, if you're a race scholar in sociology, you have a, um, you know, you're, many are very invested in the critique of, of how questions of race and ethnicity, you know, don't appear very much in the top journals, that the kind of core theoretical ideas remain untouched by questions of race and racialization. So I, I don't want to kind of present this utopian picture of sociology yeah. at all. Um, yeah. But it's still distinctively different to, and, and more positive, I think, than social policy. As to why, I, I don't know. 
and maybe you know I don't know maybe other people here have a better insight into that than I do. Uh, okay, the centres posted uh, questions. Sorry, can you read, Coretta? Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Thanks if anyone can't read. Thanks, Coretta, for this really insightful talk. I noticed that the article does not make much reference to scholars that work uh, on the field of global social policy, especially in the UK, who've tried to descend to the discipline beyond nation states and regions. Do you think that making social policy more global is aligned with deracializing it? Or um, are these two epistemological and ethical, or do these uh, two epistemological and ethical projects, or do, don't they interconnect in your view? Um, thank you. It's, it's a really good question. I don't think that a focus on global social policy is, is aligned necessarily um, with deracializing it. Mm. Um, I mean, that isn't my sense. I don't know if I'm being unfairly critical, um, but I, sorry, <laughs> not glasses. Um, I mean, there's no reason why they shouldn't inform, you know, it seems hard that you can talk about global social policy without talking about global racial hierarchies. Mm -hmm. But somehow, and, and I've noticed this also in migration research and even within criminology, the work on um, borders criminology kind of that's become a, um, a really productive subfield, surprisingly, doesn't talk very much about race. So there's, I don't know, there's some, and that's why I was kind of interested in asking all of you the question, you know, is it, is my perspective incorrect or what can explain why there is, why race is so absent when it should be so present and very obvious? Uh, Eva Lina, you was Thank you. Thank you for giving that presentation. And may I have two questions? My dissertation is on showing that white identities are not homogenous and that they should be minimized to start with. And I'm looking at the majority in the UK, again, I'm looking at the majority population and also at white minorities and um, immigrants in the UK. And my first question is conceptually, would you then consider ethnic minorities being white? Because we know there has been discrimination against Irish group in the UK historically, and now with recent migration from Eastern Europe, there are a lot of um, inequalities and disadvantages that are layered with foreign geopolitical relations, um, employment, as you mentioned, like different employment occupations by race, etc. And then, would you consider these also minorities, or because they're white, they wouldn't quite fit in, into these? divisions by race, but more so by ethnicity. And then I think my other question is, do you think that then well, what I do, especially in my second chapter, is I look at white identities, white migrant identities with the reference for different minorities of color in the UK, which kind of flips the reference point. And there's also no single reference point because the differences between Caribbean and British and Indian people of these origins. But then, would you think that that actually would help normalize white experiences, even though it's focused on white experiences, but from a different angle, and also showing how they're not homogenous? I mean, I think so. The first question I would say their groups racialized as white, but experience racialization, negative racialization in many respects. Um, and you know, my focus looking at gypsies and travellers is a classic example of that, probably more overrepresented in the criminal justice system than any other minority ethnic group, and yet not really um, part of the kind of research base. And, you know, I'm guilty in that regard historically as well. So I would see those groups as being racialised um, <coughs> because, I mean, I would use the term racialization to talk about those groups. Would I still see them as minorities? Absolutely, yeah, I would. Um, you know, in terms of a kind of their status and their position is economically and politically and 
you know, kind of socio-culturally as well, is of, um, of an inferior status. So you know, I'll see them as situated in a kind of racial hierarchy. I can't remember what your second question was. Oh, so if you're not using white as the reference category, yeah, well, does that still centre whiteness? But may not, yeah, may not be what colour as a separate reference category. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and of course that's relevant. And that's always going to be difficult in the UK because of the relatively small numbers, depending on whether you've got you know, larger sub-sample sizes for those groups, depends on what your data source is. Um, I mean, I think that that's quite a helpful way of, of kind of expanding, because I think also scholars, myself included, have become perhaps fixated more on some groups rather than others. And I think that sounds like quite a neat way of of trying, trying to widen focus, if it's possible to do, if you have enough you know, samples, you know, you have enough sizes in your sub samples. Yeah, I do. Right, yeah. A question from uh, Papo. <clears throat> Yeah, th thank you, Coretta, for uh, that very insightful talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, 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 while talking about the absence of race in uh, social policy and criminology, about uh, the issue of career uh, instrumentalism. So, uh, uh, so there are, for example, there could be minority ethnic scholars uh, who, who you would naturally feel should be inclined to investigate questions around race and might be, uh, you know, uh, studying something entirely, uh, uh, entirely uh, separate from the background from which uh, background with which they identify. So uh, this might be seen as uh, career instrumentalism that they are trying to just uh, advance their career prospects. So in that uh, sense, uh, where do you see, uh, who do you think uh, shares the bulk of the responsibility for this, uh, uh, this situation? Uh, do you think it is, uh, is it uh, for the, uh, uh, is it about the scholar uh, prioritizing his career or do you think it is more uh, about uh, the things that some other people talked about, like funding and uh, the systemic issues uh, in the department, for example? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I should start by saying, I don't assume that minority ethnic scholars will necessarily be doing things on race in their scholarship. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it was really a question. I don't have an answer to it. I don't know whether that is the case that people are doing that. I think the reality is, and my experience in 20 plus years, is that lots of minority ethnic scholars do have interests in race in the areas in which they work. But that doesn't mean that they absolutely should or that all of them do. So I wouldn't necessarily be making that kind of claim. Um, and then the question about whether it's reasonable for people to be instrumentalists about their career. I mean, it's, of course, I mean, it's a, but no, that's not something that I could make a judgment about. Um, you know, that's up to individual scholars about where, you know, where their interests lie, you know, how important it is to them, the kind of work that they do and the research, how invested they are in it. Um, personally, I mean, that's an individual judgment, I think, that people have to make on their own. I mean, if it is happening, the next part, which is, you know, where does the responsibility lie for that? I think in many ways, it's a kind of broader question about what constitutes quality of, you know, how do we evaluate what's going to determine a successful career? Um, and I think if we were more open to thinking about the possibilities of, of, you know, given that social policy is so diverse, it's got this really interesting activist history, then if we, you know, if we could be more um, 
open to ideas about what constitutes good social policy, then perhaps some of those problems wouldn't, wouldn't arise anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Coretta, I'm, I'm noticing that, well, while I was listening to you speak, I, I, I noticed um, what I can best understand as an asymmetry of, um, well, of what um, in particular? It's, it, it's an asymmetry of, of consciousness between the things that propel the problem forward and the things that we would expect would solve the problem. Because in the, uh, in the way you've described the things that propel the problem forward, your titular sleepwalking, um, you were referring to a scholastic, social and disciplinary unconscious, um, which, and, and the, there's something about that kind of the propulsion of the force that we're decrying as being not deliberate, as being um, kind of very consistent with the way I, I, I have come to think about big things in history and criminology, not as the product of virtuous or vicious decisions, but the product of a lot of very complicated motivations moving in very di different directions at the same time that as a large structural pattern have yielded big things that we, we in totality decry, like for example, mass incarceration. That's kind of on one hand, a kind of indeliberate package of lots of different things that produce something we object to. And on the other hand, the, um, in question three, you pose a decolonizing agenda I, I pick up on the word agenda in particular, which requires moving from unconscious to deliberate, that at the same time that we would want to construct um, a different canon, one that is more, um, that has a more uh, emancipatory epistemological conscience to it. That agenda also contains within it um, an affirmative act of condemnation. Of saying of, of, of condemning white supremacy. There's that it's it's not just reconstituting, it's also saying uh, uh, pointing at something, saying it's bad, and knowing what it is about it that we're saying is bad about it. That this is what I understand decolonizing in particular to, to kind of to, to call it out and know why we're calling it out. And just the asymmetry between these two kind of forces the indeliberate on one hand and the very kind of conscious and intentional and directed on the other strikes me i, I mean it is is not an asymmetry i had noticed before this afternoon um but i'm reflecting on what the consequences of if i'm right about that asymmetry what the consequences of that asymmetry might be and one of one of the reflections I'm I'm reaching while I'm sitting and, and listening is that um, if I were to be condemned for something that I sleepwalked sleepwalked into or was a product of my unconscious, it, I think it's reasonable that I would get really protective and defensive about it, right? And so the 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 protectiveness and defensiveness that um, is kind of documented as a very common reply to a decolonizing agenda is one that I'm only now beginning to see what what is that protectiveness and defensiveness an expression of to my understanding it's an expression of a reaction to um, of, a, of an act of condemnation to something that is a product of a lot of different things happening at once some of which are um, the morality of which is kind of unclear in the moment. That, that's it. Thank you. I mean, I think you're right, and I probably would agree with you about, you know, things are almost always um, the result of multiple decisions and complicated, as you, I think you use the word motivations, and I think that's true. I mean, when you ask somebody of a minority group, you know, how do we deal with racism? It's like, don't ask me that question because I don't know the answer to it. You know, it's a question for 
the people from the dominant group in this department and our society in general? I don't have the skills and tools with which to answer that question. Um, I think you're, it's interesting to ask about, um, you know, the degree to which this is. So I wonder whether it's problematic to discuss all of this as unconscious and not to reflect on, um, you know, the more conscious aspects of it. I mean, we're scholars, we, you know, we, we look outside our institution at practices and processes that create unequal outcomes for different groups. And we seem unable to reflect on some of those processes and practices, how they, you know, in a way that they may operate in the higher education sector. What sort of, you know, that, I mean, as I was saying before, some people see themselves very much as scholar activists. And in that regard, you would think that there would be that reflexivity. The advantage of talking about, and it's interesting because I've just come from talking about institutional racism with my students and considering whether it's a valid concept, is it, you know, does it go beyond just being a kind of political slogan? Can it be operationalized in any kind of meaningful way? And I always feel kind of a bit ambivalent because, you know, it's like the kind of arguments around strategic essentialism, that there is some value in solidarity that comes from identifying with an analytical category that you yourself recognize is socially constructed. And at the same time, um, you know, if we talk about things being racialized rather than racist, that might engage an audience in a way um, that might be politically valuable. And maybe the same is true, you know, with regard to kind of the unconscious and the conscious. But I think, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's a kind of, some of it, some of that's an empirical question, um, but it's not necessarily an answer that I can give, I think, as a, person from a minority group. Thanks, Greta. I think I've got time for a final question, Lucinda. No, it's fine. We're, we're taking up the time. I had about three questions. Oh, really? I, I can follow them up separately. One soon. question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in that case, um, uh, we'll say thank you very much to Coretta for uh, an extremely interesting um, um contributed to as, as the student says further questions and thoughts that we can continue to share um this term going forward so thank you very much and thank you to everybody who joined my zoom